trying to get chat GPT to do everything for you is not a good idea because chat GPT is not yet smart enough to do that. You do have to check its work. So understanding how to use the tools, but also I think it is extremely important for leaders. And I don't think this is being done enough to make sure that they are safeguarding all of us from emerging technology, as well as the technology itself. Hey, welcome to Kokoi AI, where we talk about career advice, creative outlet making, money, monetization, growth mindset, and the future to help guide creative folks through leadership, tech, and finding what makes them happiest in life. Today, I have a special guest, Laurel Tripp, who is one of my favorite people, a longtime mentor and friend. She is looking to save the planet one planet at the time. And she has recently started her own landscaping design company. She's an amazing leader and mom. Laurel is so good at painting the bigger picture and helping teams see what they want to do in their career, what is possible, strategizing on how to make it happen. She is seriously the first person to actively get me to consider management and the possibilities that would bring. Laurel, can you describe the vision and mission of your reclaimed yards and how it aligns with your personal values? Thank you for that amazing intro, Tiffany. I want to do the same for you and have just as many accolades for you. You're an amazing friend and coworker, and you inspire me probably just as much, if not more, than I inspire you. I'm starting a business called Reclaimed Yards, and it came about when I was on uh, mental health leave from working at Salesforce during the pandemic. And I was finding so much pleasure in being in my backyard doing yard work. Now, not everybody enjoys doing yard work, but I think more people want to be in their out yards. During the pandemic, that was absolutely the case when you'd see Home Depot and Lowe's sales going up astronomically as people were doing do-it-yourself things. So the basic gist of what I'm trying to do with Reclaimed Yards is help my clients reclaim their space in the backyard with nature or alongside nature or kind of adjacent, like in the case of mosquitoes and things like that. So how do we get people to use and be in the world that's right next to them in their backyards? And what inspired you to focus on it? What, where did that come from? Like full time? Yeah. Like I said, I just found so much joy in that. And it, it seems a hundred percent removed from doing what I was doing, which was managing design teams at Salesforce. But I see doing landscaping design and garden design as really problem solving as well. And it's very tangible. Like a client will say, my backyard floods, or I can't get rid of these invasive species. And I can come up with a plan, a very tact tactile to help solve for those problems. And it really leans into a lot of the design practices and processes that I've already been doing for years now. But it takes me back to my roots, pun intended, because when I went to my undergraduate degree, I was really focusing on environmental studies. So this brings me back to that, but in a very practical sense of helping individuals be a part of a sustainable ecosystem. Yeah, you talk about sustainability. Can you share insights on how you feel this new practice will impact the planet or our future? Oh, in so many ways, I hope. First off, just getting people to love the natural world as opposed to feeling like a way they have to conquer it and tear it apart and get rid of it. And you can actually, in your backyards, do a lot for the environment. You can plant trees. You can plant a lot of herbaceous plants. You can focus on natives. You can even just sheet mulch everything and just start to create better dirt in your backyard and, and help organisms that way. There's so many ways that you can help in carbon sequ sequestering and native species improvement, pollinator, thinking about our pollinators, they have to be fed year round. They just 
they're not just hungry when the crops are out. So in order to have our crops pollinated, we also need to have pollinators year round with other sources of food. And we can do that with our pollinator gardens and pollinator plants. And then another part of it is just educational and understanding that you can do things on a small scale that actually have a pretty big impact and doesn't have to be ugly and it doesn't have to be a lot of hard work. You can actually do small projects that can really have a big impact. And that's one of the things that I took actually from my experience in tech is the whole notion of agile design and failing fast and that kind of stuff. That's not how people do landscaping. Typically, they do these big projects for a lot of money. It's what we had called like the waterfall approach to design and implementation. And there's just a huge, huge amount of uh, risk in that because you're investing a lot of money and not really knowing what you're going to get out of it. And with plants, it also takes a long time to see the total fruition of a vision anyway. And so one of the things that I want to do is really do small incremental projects and one in in a way as a way to gain trust with clients two as a way to learn about their property more and their goals better and then three be able to have the ability to fail and say oops that didn't work but what we learned from that is that this will grow better or this can grow better over there and so using that sort of agile lean approach to garden design, I find really interesting. And I don't see anybody else doing it. I love that approach. As you mentioned, I have done the waterfall approach in our yard and there are still very large patches where things just don't grow. And maybe that's my fault. Probably my fault. For folks that want to work with you, it sounds like it, it's a whole relationship, like you're people for a very long time in order to get them their dream. How can they find you? I just bought the URL, reclaimedyards.com, and you can email me, laureltrip at reclaimedyards.com. Um, still in the process of getting my business license, but definitely looking to to talk to people now just to get their, I get ideas of what they're interested in. Yeah, I'm probably going to start a period of friends and friends of family pretty soon and start to to really f- get a little more flesh on the bone of how this is going to play out. What is one thing that people can do to make their yards a little bit more sustainable or to be helpful for the planet? That is a great idea. And I think it's different depending on where you are. So you're in California. And you're probably not going to be saving all the wood and leaves in your property to make compost (laughs) bin because of fire dangers. So it's very regionally specific. I think probably one of the funnest things for people to do, and you can do it even if you've got just a patio and you do a container garden, is just to do like a pollinator garden. Have three or four species or pick a pollinator that you want to accommodate to and try to figure out how you can feed them all year round. And that's going to be like three or four plants. And you can do that in your yard super easily. Anybody could do that. That's awesome. I think that'll be very helpful. Talking about your leadership, how can emerging leaders adapt to this rapidly changing technology and design field? Uh, yeah, I, as somebody who is at Salesforce on the forefront of thinking about ethics within a lot of the use of data, that Salesforce, of course, has a whole ton of data, spe- specifically consumer data. And I was always very concerned with how we or our customers were going to use that data and how we could put guardrails in place. And I think you can't stop progress. You and I have both talked about this. I don't think that the robots are going to replace us yet. I think the robots can be extremely valuable tools that we don't necessarily want to stop. We don't want to stop this progress, but we want to understand how to leverage the value as best as we can. 
trying to get chat GPT to do everything for you is not a good idea because chat GPT is not yet smart enough to do that. You do have to check its work. So understanding how to use the tools, but also I think it is extremely important for leaders. And I don't think this is being done enough to make sure that they are safeguarding all of us from emerging technology, as well as the technology itself. I think of it like you'll understand this when seeing as we both have kids, you spend like your entire life baby proofing and child proofing. I don't know when this stops. <laughs> I don't think it does stop. Maybe when they leave the house. I don't know. But you're always trying to protect your kids in some way, but not let don't you can't you have to let them experience the world and they're learning from all of this as is ai like ai has to have guardrails it has to have a safe space to explore and learn and be taught in the right ways because we all know if you're not careful your kids just pick up everything mm -hmm. i mine uh, has become increasingly attached to the f word it's actually really effing funny but if you're not careful, they pick up those things instead of the things you want them to pick up, which is like the pleases and the thank yous and all of those types of things. So I think that there is, we can't just let things run rampant and just hope for the best and cross our fingers. I think that there's an amazing amount of value that is coming out of all of this, but you need people to be able to figure out how to harness it and also figure out how to keep everything safe in that system. Mine has asked me, what does damn mean? And Ivan responded with, it's something that holds back water. And she said, no, damn it. What does damn it mean? <laughs> Just to make sure we understood what she meant, even though we knew what she meant from the beginning. I saw a post on Montessori. It was talking about how her goal is to have ch the children behave and be independent without us even being there. And that's like our goal is to release them into the wild. And I feel like AI is the same, but do you just let AI stumble in the same ways? It seems like it has much broader ramifications than the toddler that really can't get out. <laughs> it's, the same, it's the same thing. Like you want your child to fail. You want AI to fail, but you want it to be a low risk, right? Mm -hmm. So like you want your child to stumble and bruise themselves, not stumble and die that's hard to just be like so out there but the same there's the same types of repercussions with ai people can die because of mistakes that I, ai can make that's where you really want to put the safeguards and try to identify where it can go really off the rails and then it'll allow the space for things to just flow freely within that and just like with kids it's just, it's constantly evolving and constantly changing, but exponentially in the case of AI. How do we safeguard that? How, what are the guardrails to put onto AI? I, I feel like just in the same way as a toddler, how do we contain it in a space so that it only fails in that space rather yeah. than the global ramifications? Yeah, and I don't think that's necessarily possible. I was listening yesterday in PR, there was a, something about the toll that AI is happening to AI red teams emotionally from having to go out there and test out all of the bad things that AI could come up with. And it, so this is really hum, a human thing. And Google has known this from the very beginning of doing Google. They, there's so much moderation that happened within Google searches from the very beginning, just to make sure that you're screening things out for maliciousness, but also just, hey, you didn't get that search right. So it's an extremely big human cost to be able to do that. And I'm not sure that executives always understand that they should be investing in those types of things, or they think they could have just a team called Red Team and have five people on it and just keep their fingers crossed. It really needs to be much more thought out. And right now, it's really unfortunate that a lot of the tech executives are just letting things go where they will and hoping that Congress, hoping that the government, some of whom don't even know like what this technology can do, 
And then they're going to have to legislate it. it does, that doesn't make sense. The people who know the most about the technology should be the ones who are helping to keep us all safe. Talking about the executives, what do you think makes a great leader? My personal opinion is what makes a great leader is someone who's vulnerable, someone who makes mistakes and admits those mistakes and then shows how to make amends for those mistakes, right? Going through that entire process, uh, I think is really important because I know as a leader, I was always asking my teams to take risks, calculated risks. And they don't want to do that because they don't want their careers to be impacted if they make a mistake. And um, it was really helpful when I would make mistakes and show them, and this is what you do when you make a mistake and here's how you learn from it. In fact, this is like the number one thing I do with my child now. I, I think I'm more of a manager with my kid than I am a mom. There's still lots of hugs involved in my momming as opposed to my leadership, but this notion that you can learn from mistakes and actually the mistakes and learning from it, that's the interesting part of what we do is figuring out it's science, it's experimentation. It is how we've made prog progress historically as a species. Uh, and it's just so important for us to be able to, to encourage people to take those types of risks. That is really interesting because there's a huge amount of overlap between manager management and bringing up children it is very similar maybe different words but not always a lot of times it's the exact same words yes exactly and i don't want to i don't want us to be suggesting that we're infantilizing our coworkers right it's we're the still opposite. it's the opposite we are, it, it's about respect and how you help people to grow in their careers or in their lives. Absolutely. I definitely want to make sure that's understood. It's more bringing up my kids to, I respect them as an individual. You're respecting your children's ideas and feelings and trying to see what that creativity will bring rather than the other way around. Yeah. And I think people oftentimes think leadership is somebody who has this big idea and I, as a leader, felt I had to let go of that pretty early on of being the big idea person, because then it didn't allow for the growth and the creativity of the people on the teams that I worked with. It really shuts down their innovation. People think, oh, they need this big inspirational leader, but people don't feel like they have a lot of autonomy when they're driving towards somebody else's vision. Yeah. And depending on the person, that autonomy can be really important to maybe less important, but it is usually on there somewhere. On autonomy, because that's something that brings me joy, what brings you joy? I love solving problems. I think that's what a designer is a problem solver. And I love I feel like that's what I've done throughout my career, various different stages in my career. I've just addressed what can I learn to understand this problem? Then what are the various different solutions I can come up with? And then pinpointing how to get to those, how to actually execute on those solutions. So, of course, that's something that I love doing in my new business as well. I've always thought of you as a great problem solver, whatever the task how do you encourage innovation and creativity? You said you let the teams do that. How do you encourage your team in that high pressure environment? It's really interesting that you said, I think of you as a problem solver. And one of the things that I said, I, as a leader, I had to very quickly understand I had to let go of me owning the vision. I also had to let go of being the problem solver for other people. It's something I go to instantaneously. Again, I do this with my child as well, but everybody needs space to think about and process a problem. And when you rush to the solution before you think about and process the problem, you're not getting the best solutions and you're not getting the diversity of options of solutions as well. So I think it's really important to give people the space to figure out how to process 
to get to those solutions. And one of the one of the books that I read when I was on leave over the pandemic was Quiet. Have you read Quiet? It's a it's about the power of introverts in a world full of extroverts, of course. And one of the things that I really got out of that was that we live in a world of extroverts that it's just big ideas and loud and bam, brainstorming. And as an introvert, I bring a different value to the table. And all of us have various different ways that we are processing things, various different ways that we want to contribute, but everybody can contribute. And all of those contributions actually make for a more interesting solution. And obviously not death by consensus, right, in, time, in terms of cobbling things together, but thinking th things through thoroughly, I think. And so making sure that when we're doing, like, for example, a brainstorming session, that it's not just the popcorn of ideas that lend themselves to extrovert. And it's not just the the deep research that lends itself to introverts that there's so, there's a little bit of give and take in the various different processes to facilitate really interesting discussion in a product team yeah i feel like that marriage of both of those is where you get the really strong innovative ideas that resonate with more audience from your perspective are there technology and tools or gadgets that can help in this problem solving or design industry? I was actually really surprised and I have I've been going back to nature and trying to get away from the technology chaos. But in naming my business, somebody asked me when I sent her a list of so I was using you and some of my other friends to crowdsource names for my business. And one of my friends said, did you use ChatGPT to come up with these names? And I said, no, but that's a great idea. And I did. I used it. And I, I realized very quickly when it couldn't put together a pun accurately <laughs> that, that my job as a pun in chief is safe, right? But I think that what was interesting about it is, yes, I was getting ideas from 10 or 20 different friends, but then with ChatGPT, I'm getting suggestions from everything, right? It is like an amazing brainstorming tool. It's a great, just throw spaghetti up the against the wall tool to use. The same as it can be said for putting together design directions. So design tools could be used in the same way. It doesn't mean that we've taken away decision making or anything like that. But what we've done is we've shifted it to take away a lot of the onerous work of sifting through synonyms and the thesaurus to find the right word for a business. Like just to have that fresh fodder that comes through brainstorming, which is interesting. As if, like I said, it doesn't. It didn't replace me in the process. It became a really efficient way to to start to kick off a project. It's like a little buddy blocker. In all honesty, I did use ChatGPT. You will see the more boring responses were the ChatGPT ones. Yeah, did yeah. not come up with tired mom yards. It was a me. I, yeah. I can, and you can tell, you can tell the ones that real people come up with because there, there's so much more, especially because I was asking my friends Read. for ideas. And so people like know me. I, I seriously, I asked ChatGPT to come up with a plant pun using my name, which by the way is a plant and it couldn't put that together. So there's, something still necessary about the magic of humanity that is needed to guide the work. But I think that there still is the opportunity to leverage these tools to make work better and more efficient. It is not excellent yet. No, exactly. How should professionals define success when it comes to making money? Is it purely financial or are there other things to consider? 
he framed that very interestingly. How should they? Or how do they? Or how will they? I think from societal and environmental perspective, we need to redefine success in more than just monetary terms because our planet is paying the price for not monetizing everything. And the true costs of what we have in this world are not fully seen because there's not price tags necessarily attached to them yet. We're going to be paying those prices it, all, across the board in terms of the environment, in terms of social injustice. These things uh, cost lives, human lives, animal lives, plant lives. So do I think, how do we think of success in more than just the bottom, the business bottom line. And people have been talking about this a lot in various different ways. There's the whole notion of B Corps and things like that, where it's not just the financial bottom line, mm -hmm. but the ethical, societal bottom line as well. I haven't got it figured out. <laughs> and going and open, uh, starting my own business, I'm starting to see how do I want to construct my business? Do I want it to be a for-profit business even? Or do I really want to make this available to, to people who can't afford to have beautiful landscapes in their yards? And it, it, it's just seeing what you have to do to make things like nonprofits. It's actually an onerous task to be able to do that and to still have a roof over your head. So yeah, just starting a for-profit business is really like the most straightforward thing that you can do. But I think that it isn't, that's not what's going to be to save the future for our kids. It is going to be thinking more holistically about the impact that we're having. I think it came out in a, <clears throat> my previous conversation with Tim about the environmental impact of not only AI, but technology in general. and which I would love to see this built. If someone wants to build it, here's the idea is every time you do run a search or a query or some run some sort of AI, you would be able to see how much environmental impact it would be. Like how many bottles of water did this one query take? How much is leaving my computer on versus turning it off affecting something? And maybe it's, I, I know people have tried the carbon footprint things that are a little clunky. But maybe someone can solve that problem in a way that we can see yeah. what does a Bitcoin take to mine? There are so many implications for technology in general and the impact that they're having. I think I heard on, on NPR the other day that Bitcoin mining takes 2% of all world electricity usage. Yep. It's, it's astronomical. That's just, that's ridiculous. Yeah. How do you balance the pursuit of passion projects with the need for stability in a creative career? Yeah, I think this is the funny question is that I don't, I didn't, I failed at this and I failed hard and, th and that's okay because I eventually course corrected. I was fortunate enough that I was able to work for a long enough time that I made a significant amount of money and, and am now able to do a passion project. I'm not sure that I would have had the ability to be able to do what I'm doing right now if it hadn't been for the years that I put in. Now, that being said, I don't think that it needs to be a make money or pursue your passion type of thing. And I, and I think it's important to know where your limits are. And I hit my limit and needed to reset. And then I went back to work and w did reset. And I was like, okay, these are my limits now. If I lose sleep, if I have insomnia more than twice a week, I'm going to quit my job. If I, <laughs> so I had these bars then that I knew were telltale signs that I was getting stressed out by work and that it wasn't worth any money that I was going to get from them. So I think it is important to occasionally take a step back because we all think, oh, I'm making all this money. How can I do it any other way? 
it's important to take a step back and understand what it's doing to your body and what it's doing to your mind over time. Because also you're not getting any good work out of yourself if you are completely stressed out. You're not producing anything good and you're only getting money in that interaction. And then if you've got a balance where you are healthy and you can spend enough time on family and eating and right and exercising and things like that, then you can start to think about how the work you're doing is work that you can feel proud of or the way that you do your work is something you can feel proud of. So defining those things within your job as well. I've always appreciated your way of creating boundaries in a workplace, which felt like it enabled other people on your teams to do the same. Can you share an experience where growth mindset was pivotal in uh, navigating a challenging project or situation? This is a hard one because I always get, I'll be really honest, I always get confused when people talk about growth mindset. And I'm like, I got to look that up. What are they talking about? And I think it's, I think what we mean by growth mindset is the, what I was talking about earlier, that thinking about things as being very experimental and that you can continually learn and specifically learn from mistakes, I think is really crucial. So there's so many ways that I think that this is, uh, there's so many ways in which I, I saw this in my work, but I think the one that I'm, I find really interesting is when we talk about accessibility in particular, everybody thinks of about accessibility, not everybody. That's not true anymore, thank God. But a lot of people just think of accessibility in product design as something that you, is a checkbox after the fact or it's something that developers do. But increasingly, designers have been thinking about it first. And when you think about how everybody can have access to your product, it becomes a better product for everyone, not just people who can't see as see the spe full spectrum of color or not just people who can hear every single sound and tone. So I, I think that is super interesting. And watching, I, I remember one of the designers on the team that was working on the data engine in Salesforce, she almost took it as a side project of figuring out how to make the interface for this accessible because it was very point and clicky, drag and droppy, point and clicky. And, and we all knew that wasn't an accessible product. And she, as a, practically as a side project, took this on and created a beautiful interface that was so much more accessible and was able to, it would really unlock an amazing amount of use cases as a result. I love it when designers like that take initiative. That was always something that I was really always inspired by from you, Tiffany, is seeing like all of the constraints in front of you and being like, okay, I'm going to put my big girl designer pants on and just wade my way through it and make it happen. And some of the things that you did at Salesforce to push through when like, Things that nobody else seemed to care about is just like really inspiring. Oh, I appreciate that. I think that there were very large opportunities to push into at certain points at Salesforce that I feel like if you've been there for a little while, you would be able to see there's definitely huge gaps that could be much more efficient and make the company run faster and smoother. But leaning in is not always the, what I would call the closest to the sun. It's not the thing that gets to be, see the light of day, but it feels necessary for the future. So I appreciate you noticing that I will just dive in and try to solve these ginormous problems. You're always poking um, that bear. Yeah, just keep poking. Cool. What are you most excited about? I am excited as much as I love the cold weather that we have here in Georgia right now, I'm excited for spring because this is going to be like the third year of my personal 
garden and I'm just really excited to see what's going to come back, where I can move things. Like I've already got plans on where things are going to shift around and where I can continue to improve on things. Actually, right after this call, I'm going to go outside and dig a, a rain garden in my backyard. So I'm really excited to get dirty and <laughs> and just keep moving these plants around and hoping to that spring will be the start of this really interesting new career for myself. Cool. What you mentioned quiet. What should everyone be reading and watching? Oh, that's a really good question. I watch a lot and read a lot of trash. So don't necessarily look to me for good advice. Quiet was just if you're an introvert, I think it's something you have to read because it will you will understand yourself so much better. If you are an extrovert who doesn't get introverts, you should read Quiet, and then you can start to see the value in the introverts in your life. And also start to know some of your own limitations as an extrovert. In terms of watching, I have recently been binging all things Star Trek. I think there's a really, there's a lot of really interesting parallels with some of the discussions of AI that we're having. Um, I think Star Trek does it's it's not dystopian, really, as like Blade Runner or something like that. But it it shows us a lot of the positives of where technology can take us. It's really that utopian version of where te can, technology can take us. But it also has some of the seasons talk about what happens when AI takes over. So I, it I think that there is something interesting to that. And I've always just really been a fan of star trek and trying to it was symbolically going out where no no people had gone before but also i think there were a lot of changes that show had has brought to the world and lots of discussions society social discussions and economic discussions that we should be having so Origi even though Origi it's cheesy I'm original a, star trek or next generation all of them I'm all of next, them. I'm a next generation person, but uh, I've been watching all of the new ones. And I have to say, the lower decks is just really effing funny. So if you haven't seen that and you are a Star Trek fan, I highly recommend it. Is that on uh, Paramount then? Or yeah, it's all on Paramount. Yeah. Yeah. So who should I interview next? Ooh, that is a good question. So that's top of mind now that you mentioned it is Woodson. Oh, I actually love the idea about talking to him about volunteer work. And that could be really interesting. Speaking I, of social yeah. good. Amazing. Thank you for doing this with me. I appreciate you. I will say what live long and prosper. Thank you, Tiffany. This is Kakoi AI. Let's make the future awesome together. Thank you.